All right. Uh, what are we ready? Sage, whenever you are ready, you me. Begin. Um, my name is Sage Michael Rasmussen. Today, we'll be exploring what is the function of inspiration and how do people access it. Now, this was inspired by <coughs> how ironic. Um, my lack of inspiration for about four to five months. I could not do any art. <laughs> and as many of you may know, art is kind of the fabric of my being. <laughs> and so it was very scary. And it made me feel incredibly lost for a long time. Because I was starting to plan a career, you know, plan my freelancing business. And all of a sudden, I couldn't draw anything <laughs> without feeling like it wasn't good enough. And that is exactly what I'm going to ask you guys today. What inspires you? Anyone? Harry Styles. <laughs> Chloe? Uh, my children. Jack? Cool things. <laughs> <laughs> Being out of time. Oh, wow. Carla? I have Jesus. Jesus. Sick guitar solos. Of course. Particularly for you. <laughs> well, all in all, it's, it's kind of hard to define, right? We know what we like, but does it inspire us? So answering my other research question with function and accessibility, inspiration's function is to allow the brain to access and motivate new innovations and exploration, and to access inspiration through idolization, symbiotic relationships, and subconscious mastery. Delving into that, let's get into how inspiration is modeled. How do we look at it scientifically, right? Because so it's an enigma. We don't know when it's going to come or go, and it just kind of happens. <laughs> but when we study it, we'll just take a look at this. Victoria C. Olenek did a study on the scientific process of inspiration. What are the step by steps, uh, or the step by step things that happen to you as you feel inspired? And this is called the tripartite conceptualization, which is difficult to say. It's very <laughs> academic. <laughs> um, and the first piece of this is evocation, or evocation, which is a stimuli that is outside of your own brain, for the most part, that pushes you to feel inspired, which is vague, I know. But here's an example. For me, Marilyn Monroe is an incredibly inspirational pe er, person to me, simply because she was amazing. She fought for equal rights. She was, you know, one of the beautiful women of the time. She's still known today. This was three weeks before she died. This was a photo shoot that she did, and I appreciate it because it's so different from her work. And that evoked inspiration. <laughs> the second piece of this is transcendence, which means you kind of forget your needs. You forget you need to sleep at probably around 10 p.m. <laughs> Even though you got to wake up and go to school at 7 a.m. <laughs> and you forget to eat. You're losing track of time and you're doing what you love to create approach motivation. The final product, the result. For me, there's these art pieces, which are being shown somewhere. Um, and I probably spent upwards to six or seven hours doing these, straight. <laughs> and I stayed up till 3 a.m., even though I probably should have been working on this TED Talk. <laughs> I did this instead. <laughs> the other process is the component process. And this is a little bit confusing, to me at least. It's the difference between being inspired by versus being inspired to. Being inspired by is an intrinsic value. It's characteristics that you look at in a person or even an art piece, anything that you find interesting for the most part. Um, and being inspired to is taking action on that intrinsic value. For me, I adore Michelangelo and the Statue of David. 
the statue of David was created from some of the worst marble that Michelangelo had ever worked on. And it's still one of the most beautiful pieces. But am I going to go buy marble and carve my own statue of David? <laughs> no. <laughs> I simply appreciate what he did and the artistic charisma that he had. Now getting into the actual question, symbiotic relationships. Now this one was a little bit hard for me to understand, to be honest. Karina Nielsen and Munir Hamida did a study on the relationship between leaders and their followers, educators and their pupils, and how it built their self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is defined by your belief in yourself, basically. Do you believe that you can actually do the thing that you're doing? Do you believe in your job? Do you believe in your peers? Do you believe that you are able to help your peers? Things like that. Um, now what we see here, and what they studied, is they had a small group, and they had a leader-esque type of person, because usually we can identify our leaders through their charisma, confidence, and overall, kind of better than us sometimes, <laughs> and our followers. Now, leaders and followers have a very symbiotic relationship, as I just talked about. Um, when leaders encourage their followers to be able to be independent, functional, and creative in their own personal endeavors, inspiration automatically is bloomed. And I know this personally from this very project. <laughs> this whole project has been an experiment on myself. So, meeting with Lori, as my senior advisor about my project, I would feel terrified. <laughs> I feel like I am completely lost. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And then we would discuss it. We would figure out what I need to do. And by the end, I was always reinvigorated. I always was inspired to do this project again. Also, uh, when I did my own studies, I did interviews with people. I did. And there weren't very many, it was like five people. I just wanted to get the gist of what everyone was feeling. <laughs> and the question here, and it relates directly back to how educators and leaders provoke inspiration from their followers. Are there fields, subjects for you where, where inspiration is easier to access and explain? I think anything I can naturally be into, like the arts, or can be led to believe I would be good at by someone I look up to. Me and I say me. Um, <laughs> of course, when a leader is going to encourage you or an idol, someone who believes in what you're doing, believes in who you are, you're going to feel this rush of, I can do this, right? Another piece, um, do you think all fields incorporate inspiration? Becoming's one, becoming one's best self or reveling in the greatest of the inspired works of others can both be inspiring. Looking for resources. Who do you idolize? Who do you look up to? Harry Styles? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's exactly my point. Subconscious mastery. Total flip side here. This is all about the internal. It's all about your brain. How are you talking to yourself? How are you taking care of yourself? This is something Salvador Dali used quite a bit, and it's the reason why his art pieces were influential, revolutionary, and quite weird. <laughs> it's something called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia is the space between waking time and sleep. And what he would do is he'd have a bell, and every time that he, he'd lay back, he'd fall back, he'd ring, and he'd wake up. Whatever images that he saw, he would paint. And that's why he has the melting clocks and weird dog head in the background right there. <laughs> <laughs> the next piece, which I think is the more serious piece of this, is the theory of flow. And honestly, I cannot pronounce this man's name that proposed this theory <laughs> at all, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but flow,
basically is a high level of challenge and a high level of ability. And that's right in the top. You're focused. You're inspired. You lose complete track of time. I'm sure we all know that feeling of when you're looking at pictures of parasites. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're playing guitar for hours upon hours on end and your fingers are bleeding but you're still going to do it. <laughs> Now, when I did my interviews, there was a few questions and answers where I found some very specific connections. Are there fields and subjects for you where inspiration is easier to access? I asked that with the previous um, topic. Some call it Zen, I call it the undertow. It's a place where the currents move me in a direction they want me want without their, my input. Where I am the instrument, not the player, composer, artist, or writer. It's the lack of ego. And it's when you're in that space when you and what you're creating is one. Flow. And that's of course when you lose track of time and you wake up and you're exhausted because you've been spending so much energy with your brain and looking you up. Um, same question once again. You cannot be thinking. In my experience, inspiration comes from a place devoid of thought to process either negative or positive. And this just proves what I said earlier. You cannot be stressing or overthinking, thinking about your deadline, thinking about your grade, or whether you, or not your boss is going to fire you the next day. You have to be in the moment and understand that what you are doing is good for you and good for your soul. I'm going to be honest with you here. I don't have all the answers. Of course I don't. I can't say that this answer works for every single one of you. That's kind of the amazing part. Because vagueness and mystery breeds inspiration. We ask questions. We explore questions. And we love them. So whether you're inspired by your kids, or your guitar, or your son, the outdoors, Explore it. Be curious about it. This is what the school was based on. It was built from teachers and parents that wanted a different type of education for their kids. This project was built to inspire us and for us to commit to what we are inspired by. So I urge you, explore this. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Prove me right. to questions now. So audience members, please feel free to ask questions, panelists as well. What questions do we have for Sage? <laughs> I just want to know, like, what was the most influential thing that you learned through all of your research, whether it was interviews or book research, that gave you an aha moment? I think, because when I started this project, I was a little concerned with how different people's answers were. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, with the themes that I was seeing, particularly with symbiotic relationships and subconscious mastery, I was hoping that I could find my interviews to back them up. Mm -hmm. And they did, without me even asking me to. And finding those themes and finding more connectedness rather than dividedness was a great aha moment. It's about like similarity between the goals. Yeah, have an answer, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I guess I'd be curious if after doing this research, let's say you came into another five minute, five month slump, have you kind of come up with a formula for how you would move through yes. the lack of inspiration? Actually, um, because I was kind of this whole thing is self-help in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I used these different techniques and I was able to pick out, you know, I was I was used to be so afraid of asking questions in class, for instance, and asking questions questions of my leaders and of my educators. And I ended up having meetings with Rory a lot because I had to force myself to. And I was scared, but it made my project all the better. And it made my inspiration all the better. Again, every time I came out of, out of those meetings, I felt incredibly invigorated. So I think that I would be more open to asking. Just 
What do you think of that? <laughs> Is it cool? What ideas do you have? Connectedness. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the subconscious area, I learned ways that I could manipulate my sleep schedule. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> um, because I stay up till 2 a.m. every night just because I can't sleep. And still being able to push myself to create. And in those times when I can't sleep, I just draw something, do something. Particularly for me, it's about you know, artistry. So in terms of using hypnagogia, I've actually drawn dreams before to test out how that would work, and I've loved every second of it. I, whenever I am in flow, I recognize it, and I'm able to not stop it for dinner or anything. I'll let my dinner get cold before I stop working on an art piece or a project like this. So I think mostly what it is is just being aware of your relationships and your mental capacity. No. Was there anything that surprised you in the interviews? Um, I think there were a few, I was actually surprised by the lack, and again, lack of difference more than there are differences, um, between, because I did age groups, so I did some that were more in my age group, and then I did uh, my father and the teachers here. And there were such a cohesive answers. I was shocked by that. I was surprised that even generationally, there were not many uh, just conflicts. There were a few, but nothing that was drastic between age groups, and I thought that was really, really cool. Cool and awesome. Father. <laughs> <laughs> so based on what you've learned with this, um, and what you've explained to us, and things like that, and then the research that you've done and watched you do, it's been an amazing process watching you research this. If you ran into somebody who was, whether they were creative or in a completely different discipline, would you be able to help them find flow and inspiration and things like that? Could you almost give them a step-by-step -step process? Um, to be honest, I don't think I could give it a step-by-step -step process, but I could give pathways to try. Because again, inspiration is so different for so many of us. This whole TED Talk has been rather vague, and I know that. So I'm asking you guys to explore it. And test me out, because I don't know if I'm completely right. But I think that with the research that I've done and the similarities that I've seen and the themes that have come up, I could definitely help somebody at least try something new and see if it works. Are we good? Any questions? All right, sure. Thank you very much, Dave Jeffrey. Thanks for sending you out for